uh, welcome again to today's meeting. I welcome again to today's meeting and training for teachers. Uh, my name is Jojo Kumu from KPSA. I'll be moderator for uh, today's session. Uh, allow me to introduce my co-host that we'll be moderating with, co-moderator Angeline Mururi. Are you uh, around? You say hi, Angeline. Yes. Good afternoon. Welcome. Afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. So yes. I uh... Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm just delighted to be part of this group, and uh, I hope we shall have a very great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Uh, besides Angeline, we have, uh, I had said yesterday, and I can say today that uh, the meeting is being co-hosted by KPSA, as well as uh, a partner called Ayan, a digital uh, platform company. Allow me to introduce Madam Belding from Ayan, just to say hi before we formally begin. Belding. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I'm glad to be in this session. Thank you. I don't know whether Maxwell is around to say hi as well. Maxwell? He's not joined yet, but he's, he's joined. He's not joined, okay. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, I want us to begin the session of today. Uh, I want us to honor God first. Uh, I'm requesting uh, Madam Anne Kariuki to lead us in a word of prayer. Anne, you can unmute and then you say the prayers as we formally begin the session for today, kindly. Anne Kariuki. Similarly, like on some challenges, let me request uh, Mr. Benedict Benedict Muhanda. Benedict Muhanda, kindly uh, mute and then lead us in a word of prayer as we begin today's session. Uh, Sympathy Pia, Dennis Owino. Donald, Donald Owino. Okay, let's, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Jehovah, even for the day that you've given unto us, Lord. As we begin today's sessions, we commit the day to your hands. We commit the trainers, the facilitators, uh, the attendees all at your hands, oh my Father. We pray for your guidance and leading in every session as we begin. Begin with us, O oh Lord, even as we go through up to the end, O oh Jehovah. Lord, we give you glory, we give you honor. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to have a session today. We are having training for mathematics. Before we uh, a mark on specifically about mathematical mathematics training will be we we want to give the first session that the first one hour to Ayan as KPSA we are committed to towards incorporating digital uh, platform digital trainings digital um, education in our member schools. We realize that the, the world is technologically advancing and there are many things that are, are gone digital and education wise, we cannot do without this. So there've been a lot of issues about coding and how it goes. So this is part of the package that Ayan has lined up for us. They'll tell us more about coding, this digital and technical terms that we hear about, uh, how to incorporate, uh, digitization in our teaching and learning methods. This is part of, of what IAN has for us. So allow me to take this chance to welcome Belden. After the first one hour, then we'll specifically now look at the specific topics that are normally difficult to handle when we look at mathematics as a subject. So the first one hour, 
will be on digital literacy and uh, training and all that it goes with digit digitization of learning and teaching. Then the second hour, that is four to five, we'll now be looking at subjects or topic may make our students or pupils in school uh, get the most out of our teaching methods. So allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome uh, Madam Berlin to take us through the Okay, thank you so much. Kindly confirm if you're able to hear me. Yes, yes, I can hear you so well. Okay, so thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thank you so much for all who've managed to join. And uh, just like we mentioned yesterday, we started our sessions yesterday, we were dealing with English and we also had a session uh, with the teachers in charge who joined yesterday. So today equally we are dealing with mathematics and uh, before we dive into mathematics, some of the challenges that you face, especially in uh, examining mathematics, we also want to dive into a little bit of technology so that we can see how we can be able to integrate technology in our classroom. So allow me just share my screen. Just give me a moment so that I have my screen up. Okay, so I hope you're able to see my screen. Uh, today, I want us to look at some of the best practices in the classroom. So just like George has mentioned, my name is Beldin Atieno from International Education and Resource Network. We are a network of educators who are passionate about uh, teaching and learning, especially in the use of technology. We've worked with several schools in Kenya and beyond. Uh, we are an international organization and we exist in 140 countries. So uh, I know most some of you we've uh, worked with you and uh, some of you, uh, we may not really be strangers per se in this platform. So I want to welcome you to this particular session and briefly we will just be looking at some of the best practices that uh, we can have in our classrooms. My assignment is just to do the introduction this evening. We have yet another facilitator who will pick it from where, where I have left and dive into one of the 21st century skills, which is very critical in our classrooms, which is very critical to us as educators. You realize that the education system is changing and the learners that we are preparing are also different from how we were prepared some years ago. So with uh, the evolving, uh, rapidly evolving aspect of the world, we also need to move with speed as educators, especially in the private sector. You know, most of the time at uh, the private sector has always been admired because we always produce the best learners. So with CBC, how can we continue keeping up to speed with the evolving technology? How can we continue attracting more learners into our system and even producing learners that can be envied out there, learners that won't be able to tarmac for long without getting a, a placement, learners that can start up their own businesses, can come up with innovative ideas, solve the problems that we are facing in this community. So what are some of the best, practice, best classroom practices that we can begin with? So uh, some of the expectations that uh, we have for this particular session from you is to participate actively. Uh, the second one is to ask questions and also to focus on the presentation. So uh, we start our first slide with a question. You can share via the chat. If you're not comfortable uh, also, you cannot share. So you can share via the chat. Why did you pursue teaching? And then taken back in time, would you still be a teacher? If no, given better circumstances at your workplace, would you continue teaching? We can share our responses via the chat. Via the chat. Tell us, why did you pursue teaching? And then if you're taken back in time, would you still be a teacher or you would dive into a different profession? 
Maybe yes, maybe no. But if it is no, given better circumstances at your workplace, would you continue teaching? Maybe we can hear one or two responses to make it interactive. I can see via the chat someone is saying I cannot hear you. I just confirm if you've joined with your audio. The screen is not clear. Okay, let me just check on that. Okay, I have two hands raised. I have Elizabeth and Franklin. Let me just unmute Elizabeth if you have something to say and then I'll get to Franklin. Yes, Elizabeth, gone. Franklin, if you're ready, you can go on as well. Yeah, thank you for this uh, opportunity. And my answer is yes, because teaching is a calling and it is a very noble uh, profession. I will still continue. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, that one, who do you, why, uh, taken back in time, would you still be a teacher? Franklin says yes. Let me have Johnson. Johnson, you can share with us what you think. Johnson Chanyeka, thank you. Yes. Your hand is raised. Yes, yes, it is raised. Okay, go on. <laughs> I would like to be a teacher. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for your responses. I, I can like. see, I can see Elizabeth, your hand is raised and you are unmute. You can proceed. Okay, so uh, probably we'll uh, we'll proceed with those responses that we have. I'm just checking on the chat if uh, I can be able to get any. Any responses from the chat? I can see a private message. I chose that course and no first circumstances. I like it. I would still want to be a teacher. That is so encouraging. Uh, I can see Angelina says, has said, I have loved being a teacher. That is encouraging. Yes, teaching is a noble profession where the future of individuals are nurtured from Polycap. Paul says, yes, I would be a teacher. In Caps Lock, Light Hope says, I choose the course as a passion. Yes, I would be a teacher from Hosea. Josphat says, yes, I would be a teacher. I will be a teacher from David. It's the best decision ever made. Mentoring the learners is a blessing. Thank you so much for your responses. Indeed, our teaching is a noble profession and it starts from passion. Once you realize you're being frustrated as a teacher, you are not only the one who is frustrated, but you also pass that frustration to your learners. A frustrated teacher cannot uh, produce learners who come out confident, who come out enjoying what they do. So it has to come from you as a teacher. You have to enjoy first that aspect. And then the, the moment you pass it down to your learners, then you're able to pass down the right skills. So thank you so much for your responses. I want us to move on. Some of the connection points that we have during this session is that uh, we'll be calling out moments and techniques we want you to notice about how we are teaching you. At the same time, we also want to learn from you. You know, teaching is about learning and unlearning, learning new techniques, grabbing new knowledge. It's consistent learning. You cannot stop learning. That is why there's continuous professional development, especially for teachers. It's important for us to keep up to pace with how the world is evolving. So uh, some of the objectives that we have for this particular session is uh, we want to understand the basics of uh, student-centered learning 
and a typical classroom. I want you to mark the aspect of uh, student-centered learning. And then the next objective that we have is uh, gain strategies to engage and support students during the lab portions of class. I'll elaborate more on that. And then finally, to review tips for how to maximize your experience in the classroom this year. So we'll start with assessment. And in assessment, we are going to dive deep. We have two types. So anything that helps gather data about students' achievement of learning objectives, extremely critical, but often overlooked. Why do we do? Let me just see, I can get some interference. Okay, sorry about that. I think that is sorted. So uh, why do we have assessments? We have two types of assessments. We have formative assessments. Uh, these are assessments to provide information to help instructors adapt their teaching. Uh, should occur at least once or twice every day, underline the word every day, often more. Can be short quizzes, questions to the class, discussions, lab, etc. So our formative assessments do not need to be graded or scored. I know uh, right now we are evolving into the CBC and some of us are still grading and scoring. They do not need to be graded or scored. And when they are, they should be weighted relatively lightly. And then the next assessment that we have is a summative assessment. So these assessments are to determine what students have already learned, usually at the end of a unit often take the form of uh, tests or large projects. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so uh, students tend to view a summative number or later grade as the real evaluation of an assignment and are therefore likely to ignore comments that accompany them. So uh, some of the engagement tips that um, I want us to look at this evening, some of the engagement tips and techniques that uh, we can share with our students are uh, the four that include wait time, cold call, think pair, that is group, or and active learning. So we'll dive deep into these engagement tips. The more you engage your class, the more the information you can have about where your students are, especially in understanding of the lesson. As mathematics teacher, how often do you engage with your class? The fact that the syllabus is over, or rather the projects that you are working on is over, does it mean that you are on the same, uh, you are in the same line with your students? So you need to engage frequently with your learners to ensure that you're moving together. And these three steps that I want us to look at, uh, uh, maybe we can form it part of the engagements that we use in our classroom, not just tied to the four, but you can use others as well that have been working for you. So we'll start with the we'll start with the wait time. So for the wait time, uh, that is a timer glass. Uh, maybe you have interacted with it. And for the timer glass, mostly uh, if you are if you want to time it, maybe for one second, you have uh, your solution at the top. Once it gets at the bottom, then you realize that your time is uh, done with. So let's look at uh, when you ask a question to the class, how many seconds should you wait before calling on a student to answer your question? For example, you give them a sum on the board, how many seconds should you wait? You can share your responses, enter a number between zero to 60 in the chat. In zero to 60, we are talking about seconds. So between zero seconds to 60 seconds, how many seconds should you wait? You could share your responses via the chat. You ask a question to your class, how many seconds should you wait? Okay, I see one response, I have 10 seconds. 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 20, 30, 30, 10, 15, 45, 30, 10, 15, and the number continues. Thank you so much for your responses. So let's get, uh, okay, I have a hand raised. Let me just allow you to unmute so that you can share your response as well. Yes, Chelanga Shroslin.
you can unmute. Uh, there's a pop-up that comes to your screen that the host would like to unmute you. You can unmute and share with us your verbal response. Okay, the hand is lowered. Probably it was raised by mistake, but let's go with the responses that we have on the chat. So let's look at this next scenario that we are sharing. So we have the wait time diagram. So what's, what's about the, head, the wait time diagram? After zero seconds, there is no hand because they're still internalizing the question. You gave them a sum, uh, what is uh, these times this? Maybe they need to apply the board mass rule or they need to apply other formulas. So they have to internalize that question and get your response. So in zero seconds, none will be prepared. When you look at three seconds, we have at least, let me say four hands that go up. And then after 10 seconds, you realize that majority hands continue coming up. And then what happens after 30 seconds? You realize that it's red. Red means danger. So kids hate silence. So when you use the wait time to get more uh, students ready to answer your question, students need time to process the question and formulate an answer. If you wait more than 30 seconds, the students may get, um, they may get uh, a little bit, um, they may, they may get uh, antsy or uh, lose focus in the topic. But even with the wait time, you often get the same hands over and over. So how do you bring in fresh students? That is yet another question. Because the question is, uh, anytime I wait for 10 seconds or I wait for 15 seconds, 20 seconds or 30 seconds, it's still the same hands. So how do you bring in fresh students? You can share your ideas. How can you bring in fresh students to raise their hands? Because by default in a classroom setup, there are those students who do not raise their hands. So how would you bring them in to raise their hands? Let's get your responses. Maybe two, two responses would do. You do the correct wait time. You don't go beyond 30 seconds. And then uh, you still have the same hands raised the same, same hands raised, no new hand, still the same hands raised. How can you bring in new, new students to raise their hands? There's a hand raised. Okay, so uh, is it the same hands that will be raised in my classroom setup as well? <laughs> Let's see about that. Okay, go on, Mr. Ken Osala. Okay, still not ready. Let me try Madam Faith Kanana. When you get a pop-up to unmute, you can unmute and share. Okay, let me try a server MCLE. Okay, I think you can give them leading questions. Okay, uh, thank you so much. He's talking about leading questions. Uh, Faith, Faith Kanana, you're, you're on unmute. You can uh, share with us. Okay, so uh, maybe we can go with that. There's a new hand, Kasper. Kasper, you can unmute. Kasper Makunja. Yeah, I think uh, one way you can bring in new students is by reframing the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your responses. Let me see if I have more on the on the chat. I can see uh, there is light up says you may call their names to answer. Uh, simplify your explanation. You can repeat the question, repeat the quiz, give them leading questions. And all those are correct answers because at the end of the day, you might realize that they're not raising their hands because uh, maybe overweight, if they raise their hands, they didn't, maybe they didn't get the question. And sometimes it's because of how you, how you teach as a teacher. We'll talk about how you engage with your learners. Sometimes you're used to telling them that, no, that is very wrong. So uh, how do you respond to wrong answers? That it could encourage the student or it could discourage the student. So that also goes back to us, how are we responding to 
the quest, the answers that we get from our learners. So let's look at some uh, connection point again uh, about uh, how we can motivate more learners to share with us their responses. And uh, about the waterfall chat, this one you can allow them to give their responses anonymously without getting the names of the person who wrote that particular response. You realize that some students are a little bit shy. They do not want to share their responses verbally because of fear of being wrong which is actually happening to some of the learners that we interact with. And then there's also the aspect of cold call. Someone said uh, the aspect of calling out their name. So what about the cold call? How should it happen? So uh, for the cold call, we have three parts. We have after question, before question, after question with warning. So in this diagram, we have different scenarios. So after question, you call out a student directly after you ask a question that is after question and then before the question you tell a student hey stand up and then you tell them i'm going to ask you this question and you're going to respond so you call out a student before you ask a question that is before question and then after question with warning uh, you tell all students that you know i want to ask a question and i will be calling any of you to respond to this question so which calling method do you think works best? Which calling method do you think works best? I want it to be as interactive as possible. I want, I want us to engage with the, what you think can work for us in a, our typical classroom setup. Remember, we are talking about best classroom practices. We'll dive into 21st century skills. Uh, just after this particular session, I see I have four minutes to finish this session so that I take it to the next presenter. So which calling session do you think works best? After question, you tell uh, you read out the question and then you call one student or before question, you tell a student to rise and then you tell them I'm going to ask you a question. Which one do you think works best? Let me have uh, Hosea, Mr. Hosea Kipto. Mr. Hosea Kipto, you can unmute. I think the best method you can use is you call first the student and then you read out the question. Then you give time uh, the learner to, uh, to answer the question. Okay, so before you unmute, thank you so much for that response. The question is, what about the other learners? Do you think they'll concentrate? Yeah, they are going to concentrate. Okay, thank you so much for that response. Uh, I have yet another hand from Sylvester Nyaga. You can unmute. Let me just have you on unmute. You can unmute. Okay, as for me, I prefer I ask the question first before the response of the students. Because some of the students, if you just raise them before you ask a question, they have that fear of expressing themselves. They really don't know which question you are going to ask. So personally, I prefer asking a question, then I choose as the student meditate on what to answer. Okay, thank you so much for your response. Uh, let me have one more response from Viona Walela. Viona Walela, and then I uh, will analyze all this situation. Okay. Can you get me? Yes, I can hear you pretty well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be prefer after question because the learners will be prepared to answer the question. And like before question, the learner will tense and maybe doesn't know the question. So that tension will, will be there in the learner. So the best method for me is after question. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your response. Thank you so much uh, for your responses as well. I know there are other responses on the chat, but I see I have two minutes, so I won't be able to go to the chat. So uh, let's analyze this diagram. So the diagram that we have here, uh, we have the red uh, warning alert on after question and also the red warning alert before question. So uh, there is, we are suggesting the aspect of using after question with warning. This is because uh, when you, sorry about that. When you use the one without warning, let me say the before question, you tell Alana to stand up and you ask them a question directly. You might find, you might get them by surprise and you might end up embarrassing the student that you call on. That is the before question one. And then uh, avoid use, using the call to embarrass or surprise your students. You don't want to single out one particular student before asking a question. 
because yes, they could be embarrassed, but it also gives the rest of the class the clearance to not pay attention to your question. Because if I tell you, hey, stand up, you're the one I'm going to ask you the question. Other learners would be like, ah, it's not us being asked. At the end of the day, it's just this learner that is being asked the question. What about us as we want to be asked the question? So we can continue doing our own things. They can continue being cheeky. But after question with warning, you tell uh, the whole class that you know I'm asking a question and uh, I will point one of you whom they do not know. So at the end of the day, they are, they are all paying attention to the question because they all know they are accountable for knowing the answer. So we have yet more to share about what we can do in our groups. At the same time, how we can maintain a nice rapport with our learners and also give them positive feedback. So because my time is up, let me invite the next presenter. Let me just confirm if Maxwell is in. We will proceed from where we have left now tomorrow, same time. So keep time. Let me just stop sharing my screen. Have uh, Maxwell's screen up so that he can proceed with the session. I see I have a lot of hands. We will be able to proceed. Uh, maybe in the Q&A session, we can be able to answer the questions that are still pending. Maxwell, if you can hear me. Yes, uh, loud and clear. Belding, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Sure, we can hear you. So, uh, good evening once again, uh, colleagues. Uh, Maxwell is my name. For those who are joining in for the first time, we were together yesterday, where we are looking at uh, 21st century learning uh, design. So, uh, today we proceed into our second dimension, that is knowledge construction. Yesterday, I took you through uh, what we call collaboration in classroom. So uh, allow me to take you through uh, this in a couple of few minutes. Uh, then uh, in case there'll be any questions arising, we can take them at the end of the session. So uh, <clears throat> talking about uh, knowledge construction, uh, many a time we want to ask ourselves, is knowledge static or is it, uh, or is it dynamic? So, um, Knowledge, as teachers, we all know that uh, knowledge keeps on uh, evolving. And like uh, some of us that were taught in the, in the, in the 20th century, you realize that uh, the teacher was the only source of uh, information. So we never got a chance probably to share so much about what we understand about a given concept. So. Um, and this call goes on to many of our education uh, systems. Remember, these were initially designed during the Industrial Revolution, uh, which, uh, which means that uh, focus was on preparing learners for the factory line. So educators shared information and learners recalled it either orally or in written form. This education model generally views knowledge as fixed and transmissible thus placing a very high uh, value on learners sitting passively to absorb information. Yeah, so the teacher is the know-it-all, eh? the only source of information. But uh, in 21st uh, century, we realized that in the advent of uh, so many social media platforms and all that, uh, do we ever ask ourselves uh, how much information is out there exposed to these uh, learners? For instance, uh, per minute, you find that um, every passing minute, Instagram users share about 695,000 stories, while Snapchat users create about 3.4 million snaps. YouTube only users upload about 500 hours of content every minute. Remember, this is data arising from every minute as, as, as of 2021. Twitter users tweet about 350,000 times, while email users send nearly 200 million messages. So we are living in a world where knowledge is dynamic and constantly evolving. So in today's world being uh, globally connected, the industrial model of education is obsolete. We can no longer rely on the 19th century uh, uh, education model. So it seems that uh, memorizing and regurgitating information is no longer enough for our young, us, for our young people to navigate a, a workforce. So they must be able to filter and process the ever increasing flow of information and effectively apply it where it is needed. So schools must therefore design uh, learning opportunities that move beyond repetition 
and train learners to think uh, critically and uh, construct uh, knowledge. How then can learners uh, be able to think critically and construct their own knowledge? So with the advent of internet search engines, uh, learners no longer need to memorize a lot of facts. Instead, they need to know how to use facts and information to construct their own understanding and also make connections and generate uh, ideas. So learners can construct knowledge by engaging in deep learning through such activities as interpret interpretation, uh, analysis, synthesis, and uh, evaluation. And you'll realize that some of these activities are directly uh, borrowed from uh, the, the Bloom's taxonomy uh, of cognitive skills. So once learners have a firm grasp of concepts and ideas, the next step is to deepen their understanding by applying that knowledge in a new context. And at the deepest level, educators must design interdisciplinary learning activities that encourage learners to make uh, connections across disciplines. So by engaging learners in such activities, uh, the role of an educator data has greatly changed or has greatly shifted from being a mere uh, transmitter of content to a constructor of knowledge. So by paying attention to learners' knowledge, uh, uh, skills, attitudes, and beliefs, we are basically shifting to a learner-centered environment that encourages learners to ask questions, engage in social discourse, and uh, find uh, their own answers. And therefore, what rubric do we use for knowledge construction? The 21st century uh, learning design knowledge construction rubric explores whether learners construct and apply knowledge, and if that knowledge is interdisciplinary. Knowledge construction occurs uh, when learners do more than reproduce what they learned. They go beyond technology production to generating ideas and understanding that there are new understanding ideas that are new to them. It's therefore uh, the skill of knowledge construction often uh, also referred to as critical, uh, critical thinking. If you remember the four C's, uh, the 21st century learning skills, critical thinking being one of them. So uh, the knowledge construction rubric captures the big ideas of the dimension and is a useful framework uh, when designing learning activities. So, when you want to do knowledge construction, uh, you, we can use a knowledge construction uh, decision tree. Uh, that means that uh, by asking yourself, does, does it require knowledge construction? If yes, then uh, what is the main requirement for the knowledge construction? Then learners are required to apply their knowledge in a new context, yes and then uh, proceed to learning activity is interdisciplinary. So these are the critical uh, questions or the key, uh, what you can call uh, 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 target indicators of, for a teacher who is planning his classroom towards uh, gaining knowledge construction uh, as a dimension in 21st century learning uh, design. So what learning activities will require knowledge construction? Uh, the knowledge construction uh, activities uh, will ask learners to interpret, analyze, synthesize, or evaluate information or ideas. Interpretation aspect of it means drawing inferences uh, beyond the, 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 the literal meaning. For example, uh, we can have learners reading a description of a historical period and infer why people who lived then behaved the way uh, they did. Then the analysis part of the, the, the knowledge construction of the activity means uh, learners are able to identify the parts of a whole and their relationships to one another. For example, uh, learners might investigate local environmental factors to determine which are most likely to affect uh, migrating uh, birds. Then we have the synthesis activity, which means uh, learners are able to identify the relationships between two or more ideas in this case, uh, learners might be required to compare and contrast uh, perspectives from multiple sources. And then we have the evaluation activity, which means judging the quality, credibility, or importance of data, ideas, or events. Mm -hmm. Learners, for example, uh, may be able to read different accounts of a historical event and determine which ones they find uh, the most uh, credible. But not all learning activities that are commonly described as research involve uh, knowledge construction. 
Learners who look up, for example, information and then write a paper that describes what they found are merely reproducing uh, knowledge. They are not constructing uh, knowledge. They are not even interpreting or analyzing or synthesizing or evaluating anything. If, however, these learners write a paper comparing and contrasting information from multiple sources, they are then constructing knowledge. In addition, uh, if an activity, for instance, asks learners to practice a procedure they already know, or if the activity gives learners a set of steps to follow, the activity doesn't, does not require knowledge construction. So to determine whether learners might already know a certain procedure, consider what is typically expected of learners of their, uh, of their age. So some of the scenarios uh, that don't qualify a knowledge uh, construction activity, for example, learners writing a paper describe the describing the crime a character committed, or learners using Bing to search the internet for information about local activities to help the environment and giving a presentation to describe what they found. A scenario here could be learners familiar with the barometer using one to measure atmospheric uh, pressure and or learners who have already learned the definition of parallel, then using the definition to decide whether several sets of lines are parallel or not. On the other hand, scenarios that could qualify as knowledge construction can include uh, learners using details in a story to infer the reasons why a character committed a crime, or learners using Bing to search the internet for information about local activities to help the environment, and analyzing it to find additional ways to help. Learners could also be comparing different explanations for the changes in atmospheric pressure to determine which explanations are credible. And uh, finally, uh, learners who have not learned about parallel lines go ahead examining several different pairs of lines to develop a definition of uh, parallel. So is knowledge construction the main requirements then? The main requirement is the part of the activity uh, which learners spend the most time and effort on and the part that educators focus on when grading. So if the learning activity does not specify how much time learners spend on each part, you use professional judgment to estimate how long learners uh, are likely to spend on different, uh, on different tasks. So the following scenarios, main requirement might not be uh, knowledge construction, or rather the main, the main requirement is not knowledge construction. For example, learners spending 35 minutes listing details from a story and then spend 10 minutes using those details to infer why a, a character committed a crime, for example, or uh, learners uh, earning 70% of their grade for finding information and 30% for analyzing what they found. On the contrary, these other scenarios, the main requirement is knowledge construction. That is, learners spending 10 minutes listing details from a story and then spending 35 minutes. Look at the time factor here. 10 minutes listing the details from a story and then spending 35 minutes using those details to propose uh, why a character committed a crime. Learners might also be and 30% and of their grade for finding information, and then 70% uh, for analyzing what uh, they find. So these two scenarios are committing more time to a learner-centered activity or to a more elaborate way of generating or creating their own uh, set of information or knowledge. So are learners then required to apply their knowledge in, in a new context? Application is a very key uh, aspect of uh, learning. Learners do apply their knowledge when they use the knowledge they have constructed in another knowledge construction task in a new uh, uh, context. For example, you can have learners in a physics class construct knowledge about heat principles from a study of, let's say, the arts in a core, and then apply that new learning to investigate the environment uh, of, let's say, a planet like Jupiter. The second knowledge construction task deepens understanding because uh, learners abstract what they learn 
and to apply it in another situation. So it's not just enough uh, for the two contexts to differ only in surface features. Learners cannot respond to the new situation simply by applying the same formula. They must use uh, interpretation, analysis, synthesis, or evaluation to decide how to use uh, what they learned in the new uh, context. So scenarios that don't require learners to apply their knowledge could, uh, could be like uh, learners analyzing demographic statistics from their hometown and then analyzing demographic statistics, statistics from uh, a second location of their choice. And then uh, another example could be, let's say, learners examining photos enlarged at different sizes to develop an understanding of similarity and then describing their, uh, describing their understanding. Learners in, their, in, in theater, for example, also uh, in, a, in a theater class could analyze the characters in a play to learn about character development and then uh, writing an essay about uh, what they learned. Remember, these are uh, scenarios uh, in which uh, learners do not need to apply their knowledge in, in, in new context. So what scenarios then uh, require learners to apply their knowledge in, uh, in a new context? For example, using our first scenario in, uh, in the just previous example I've given, learners analyzing demographic statistics from their hometown and then using uh, the understanding of population, uh, population trends to develop a plan for upcoming housing development project that is application knowledge. Or learners examining photos enlarged at different sizes to develop uh, an understanding of similarity and then applying that knowledge to abstract uh, geometric shapes or thinking about size, ratios, angles to determine which shapes are mathematically similar, that is application. Or even learners in a theater class analyzing the characters in a play to learn about character development, and then using, let's say, Microsoft Video Editor to create their own one act play demonstrating uh, what character development is about. All these are scenarios that uh, uh, represent uh, application uh, in, in learning process. So uh, is, uh, is, is a learning activity interdisciplinary when you are look, designing it? When do we say a learning activity uh, is interdisciplinary? Interdisciplinary learning activities have learning goals that involve content, then important ideas, or methods from different academic subjects such as mathematics, and music or a language or arts and history. Subjects that are typically taught together do not count as uh, interdisciplinary for the purpose of uh, uh, this rubric. In addition, uh, even though learners often use uh, ICT, that's information and communication technologies as a tool for learning in other subjects, ICT is not considered a separate academic subject within this rubric. For example, uh, learners might build ICT skills when they do online research for a history project, but this activity isn't considered interdisciplinary. So some of other activities that may not be considered interdisciplinary within a class setup, for example, could be um, learners probably, let's say in a science class, writing persuasive letters to an environmental organization about the results of the experiment and educators then grading the students only on the quality uh, of their data. Another scenario would be uh, maybe learners in a science class plotting points on a graph and no learning goals for math are uh, defined. Or learners in a physics, use, uh, in a physics class uh, using ICT to present their work to the class. On the contrary, uh, scenarios that can be considered interdisciplinary would be, for instance, using still the examples that you've given in the previous uh, discussion, learners in science class writing persuasive letters uh, to an environmental organization about the results of the experiment, and then the educators grade the students on the quality of one, their data, and their writing, and their writing skills. 
or even learners in a science class going ahead and plot uh, points on a graph and learning goals for both the math and the science uh, lesson are well, uh, well defined. So talking about knowledge construction, what are the tools that are at our disposal as educators that we can use uh, for knowledge uh, construction? So when learners conduct research, for instance, they will need to analyze or use to construct new knowledge. Microsoft Edge, a very important uh, tool, supports organizations with the collection of features which allow learners to create collections to organize uh, their research. One note, on the other hand, we talked about this also yesterday, uh, a OneNote class notebook, for example, allows educators to share content. Then additionally, educators can also store graphic organizer templates in OneNote that encourage interpretation, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. So as learners research a topic that they will apply in a new context, they store uh, key concepts from the research in OneNote. With digital inking, learners can an, an, an it, uh, and analyze the research they collect. And then as learners work in OneNote or immersive reader, or in one note, Immersive Reader, which is a very powerful tool also in Microsoft, offers reading and translation uh, and translations. This might come in handy, especially for special needs uh, education. If you have educators in the house who are dealing with special needs uh, learners. We also have features like Smart Art Graphics in one and PowerPoint, which provide additional support uh, for knowledge construction in the form of graphics that help learners demonstrate uh, their understanding, interpretation, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation uh, and evaluation of information. So we are not just looking at uh, the 21st century uh, learning design. We are also looking at tools that can help you as an educator to master this uh, aspect of 21st century learning design. Yesterday, we looked at a few under, knowledge, under collaboration and then today we are also uh, wrapping up by looking at uh, the tools that can help you as an educator and even the learners uh, effectively construct uh, knowledge. I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope I'm still in time. I didn't take much time. So uh, unless there's any question, I will uh, hand over the program back to uh, Beldi. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Maxwell. Uh, I want to hand it back to Angeline. I want to take it back to Angeline so that she can welcome the next speaker. Remember, we will have all our questions at the end of the session. Stay tuned. I see more hands are going up. Uh, we will open it up at the end of the session. So just keep it down in written form, and then we will be able to handle them all at once. Angeline, if you can hear me. OK, thank you, Beldin. Uh, again, my name is Angeline, and I welcome all the members uh, that, that have decided to be with us to, to, today evening. We are happy to be together in this session. So at this moment, as Belden has said that we shall have a question, the question in time, maybe you can post your questions on the chat and then Belden will go through them and then before uh, we close the session, we can be able to tackle them. On behalf of KIPSA, we are very delighted to have you, members, uh, this evening. And uh, KIPSA is uh, very ready to make sure that all teacher training programs are done professionally to make our teachers better equipped than uh, any other teacher maybe in the country. We thank you and uh, for being part of this. Uh, Kipsa, as Kipsa, we are also having some assessments just for you to know that are going to be out very soon from PP1 to grade seven and then a KCP trials uh from the 25th to 28th that is when the the papers will be released but booking is 
up to 14th of October. So we encourage all our members to make sure that they get our KIPSA papers as they are one of the best, especially as we are preparing for our KCP and also preparing our learners for the next level. We also have end term assessments and we shall keep on uh, communicating to you on the times when the booking will also be done for our end of term. Uh, end of term. So we are happy to partner with IAN. We have done very well uh, in impacting knowledge. As a teacher, learning is an everyday activity. There is no time you will say that you are done with learning. And we are happy that we are able to incorporate ICT in our learners as you have noted that our learners in this 21st century, they cannot continue with the old methods of teaching as it used to be some times ago. Again, we can also not rely on the methodology we were taught maybe five, 10 years ago with the current child. So at this moment, uh, we want to start off with uh, my, our training today, which is mathematics with the teacher Raphael, a very resourceful uh, facilitator who will take us through so that we can be able to equip our learners for the best as they do uh, the KCP and as they prepare in, uh, in the uh, academic work. So at this moment, I hope Teacher Rafael is, uh, can hear me. Teacher Rafael. Yes, Angelina, I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, oh that's very good. Welcome. Yeah, this is the team we are having and uh, we are excited to have very many teachers of mathematics ready to listen to you as we get to know more about mathematics. Welcome teacher Raphael. Thank you, Angeline. Good afternoon. My fellow teachers, I hope all is well. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank Kepsa for granting us this chance to come together and uh, just talk to one another through equipping session. You know, sometimes we wonder if you just eat at your home and you don't have a chance to visit the others. Sometimes you may end up saying that you are the only one who cooks good food. It's always good to visit and hear what the others are doing. So like Angelina said, my name is Raphael. I'm a teacher by profession. And I hope you guys can hear me. Eh? Somebody just confirmed that I'm loud enough. Yeah. I'm loud enough. Yes, we I just want somebody you. to confirm. Can you, you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to share my screen with you. Confirm you can see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Okay, let me try to make it. Mm -hmm. Want to. I'm trying to make it a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. So we are going to start off, like I said, my name is Raphael, and I want to welcome each and every one of us to this mathematics equipping session and examination feedback. I'm a teacher by profession and also one of the directors of the National Examinations Hub. 
my phone number is right there. I'll be able to share it later in case you have questions. <clears throat> Angeline, I'm trying to share this screen. I don't know why I'm in Paris. I'm uh maybe you can try clicking the second uh slide because i can just see your cursor in the first slide yes the second one yeah. i want it full screen uh maybe what you okay. can do at the top yeah. of your screen there is home insert design transition slideshow click on yes. slideshow okay i'm there so once you click on slideshow go from beginning okay the first one from beginning at the top it's written from beginning uh, right oh. the other side uh, right below side. file yes. from, from beginning, beginning. Ah, yeah 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 yes. yeah just click on that that's okay beginning. okay now wow thank you thank you thank you I want to go to the previous one yeah Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. So welcome, my fellow teachers, to this equipping session. We are here to do very simple things. We are supposed to equip one another and also give feedback of the exam that we just did the other day. So before I begin, I want to say that uh, in mathematics, we have a clarion call that whatever we do, wherever we are, we are supposed to take the child as the most critical worker. We are doing whatever we are doing because of the child. Even the cleaners who come to school to clean, the watchman, the drivers, we are all centered towards the child. So even whatever we are going to discuss here, if it is not something that is going to help the child, then it will be an exercise in futility. Uh, I want to take this chance to welcome you uh, once again. Make sure you are listening. You have an open mind. If you have a question, I request you keep it until the end, then we'll be able to answer you. So I want to take you through what we have today. Uh, number one uh, is the KCP mathematics specific objectives. These ones are well known by all of us. And number one is to acquire uh, an understanding of numbers and numerations. Uh, number two is develop ability to perform four basic operations. We have four major basic operations. We don't have any other. If a child is not able to perform the operations, however much we introduce other difficult concepts, we are not going to, to go anywhere. So our major foundation is the operations. Number three, we are supposed to, or rather the child is supposed to develop skills in measurements, approximation, and estimation. The child is also supposed to develop spatial concepts. Spatial here means uh, relationships between objects and how things are related, and also ability to use them. The child is also supposed to acquire techniques of collecting, representing, and interpreting data. We are also supposed to help the child develop positive attitudes towards mathematics. Sometimes when I talk to teachers, I ask them, why are your learners failing in mathematics? There could only be two issues. Either it's a capacity issue or it's an attitude issue. If it's a capacity, you know what to do. If it's attitude, you know what to do. So I want to challenge all of us. You know the learners that you are teaching in class. If you are able to come up with two columns. Those who fail maths because of capacity issue, they are not, not able to do it. And there are those of us who fail maths, not because we are, we are not able to do it, but because of the attitude. So we are supposed to make sure, even before you train that learner about the operations, about the concept, you are supposed to take care of the attitude. Then lastly, we are supposed to help the learner develop techniques of investigating and problem solving strategies. This is us. As teachers, we are not just to follow books. There are a lot we are supposed to do to support that concept that we are teaching. You cannot just go to class and you start uh, talking about concept, concept, concept. 
there is a lot you are supposed to, to prepare that child to start getting the concept in, in mathematics. So the performance cycle looks like this. This is what I call performance cycle. I came up with it. And excellent performance is as a result of the effective execution of each of the following phases. So this is how the teaching should happen in class. We have the first one, teaching. You are the teacher or myself as a teacher, I am teaching. The learner is learning. Then after doing teaching and learning, you are supposed, don't go to teach something else. So some of us, we are used to introducing concept after concept. Teach, you as a teacher. The learner is supposed to learn. Then after that, before you introduce something else, you are supposed to do what you call evaluation. This one, you can use CATs. You can use your own way of evaluating. Test the learners on that specific concept that you are teaching. After that, you are supposed to analyze. Analyze here means you have divided that evaluation test into different cognitive skills. So which specific area are your learners starting? Or which area did they not understand? Which area are they doing well? So we don't just evaluate. You don't just give them a CAT, mark, and return. Tell them you have 10, you have 15, you have 20. No. There is a whole process of analysis where you're supposed to sit down, create something called postmortem analysis. That one doesn't look nice because people don't like postmortem. They relate it with death. But here in maths, we do something called PMA, postmortem analysis of any CAT or any questions that you, or any method that you have used to evaluate your learners. So do your own analysis. After that, give feedback. Give feedback to the learners or to the parents or the people who, are, who matter. And especially feedback should be given to the learner on specific areas. So we teach, we learn, we evaluate. After that, we analyze, we, then we give feedback. After that, then we decide whether we are going to teach or to introduce something else. Remember, teaching and learning are inputs, while evaluation, analysis, feedback, and our outputs. Most of us, we just do the input, but we forget the outputs, which are also very, very important. So let, you can ask yourself, which one have you been doing well? And by the way, what percentage should take the uh, most of your time? It is output as compared to input. Next slide, uh, ACP Mathematics General Performance. I was not able to capture 2021, but uh, at least you can see the national mean. In 2015, 28.08, this is out of 50. 2016, 22, there was a drop. And 2017, 25 out of five, uh, out of uh, 25.57 out of 50, 2018, 21, this was the, this is arguably the most hardest paper, KCP 2018, those who have been doing mathematics, you can bear me witness that KCP 2018 mathematics was the hardest, and that's why the highest was given a 99%. So the mean was 21.57. In 2019, there was a bit of improvement, there was 24.65, KCP 2020, 27, 0.45. Standard deviation, we have 10.77, 9, 10, 8, 11, and 11. I've not been able to do for this year, but I'm sure most of us have. Just to pass you through, standard mark, this is how NEC, this is the, this is the formula NEC uses to come up with, with the mark. So NEC uses the formula below to get the standard mark for all the PPs in the country. That is standard mark. You take the, row, the 50 marks, plus the row mark minus mean times 15 divided by the standard deviation. Like in the year 2020, a child who scored all the questions right was given 80.173. So maybe you can try to do this in your school. You can try to use this formula if you are able to do so, so that at the end of, the, at the end of KCP, when the results come, your children are not surprised. What is happening? A child getting 100% in school, you've been giving this child 
in KCP, this child has 80. So how are you able to explain? I think it's good you tell them as early as now about standardization so that they are not caught up by surprise. So the next slide, uh, you'll allow me to move faster. There's a slide I want us to take time on. So this is a table of specification. Uh, areas tested, numbers take the, uh, the lion's share in any paper, in any standard paper. In KCP 2020, numbers at 13. And when you talk about numbers, you talk about total value, area, fra not area fractions, decimals, percentages, all those ones are in numbers. 13 questions in 2020, 2019, 11 question, 2018, 14 questions, 2019, 14 questions. In measurements, I'm sure you can see this. So this is just to help us revise. And also those of us who like making our own exams, you can be able to tell which areas carries a lot of question. Allow me to move first. I said there's a, a slide I want us to take a lot of time in. So if you look at KEPSA, the one that we just did the other day, it was almost the same. And I want to thank KEPSA for doing a good job. Your exams are almost KCP. Actually, I call them KCP replica. They follow that. In, if you look at this example, the one you just did, I didn't do, I didn't analyze KEPSA for class C, grade, grade six, because I didn't have, I don't have another one. They have not done this before. But for grade seven and eight, you can see numbers, uh, the grade seven, 13 questions, class eight, 15 questions, measurements, 16, 12, geometry, five questions, Money, five questions, six questions in class, class eight. Algebra, five questions and four questions in class eight. Percentages, three questions and four questions in class eight. Graph, one in class seven. There are two in class eight. Tables, one in class seven and one in class eight. Averages, one in class seven and one class eight. So I can say case uh, CAPSA exams are almost KCP replica and they can be relied on when it comes to preparing learners for KCP. So uh -huh, KCP most failed questions. Uh, if you look at the KCP newsletters, you'll be able to see most failed questions. Most failed questions. Most of them comes from these areas. In KCP 2020, there was word problems, surface area of closed cylinder, area of combined shapes, formation of simple questions. In 2019, most failed questions came from surface area of an open cuboid, then uh, properties of parallel lines, uh, difference between direct and indirect proportion, reading and interpretation of graphs. In 2018, you can see where the areas uh, that gave us the most difficult questions. I'm sure if most of us in our schools, we have KCP newsletter, we can be able to see this data and use it well in our learning. Now, grade six, most failed question, the one we just did the other day, if your school did uh, the CAPSA paper or the CAPSA exam, last term, end of term exam, these were the most failed question according to our own analysis. There was a question six in class six. It was testing the side of a square given the area. This is an area that is tested mostly in grade six and is supposed to be taught there, revised, so that by the time they are going to class seven, they, they are well equipped in that area. There was a question 11, operations of combined, uh, uh, combined operations. This has to do with board mass. There was a question like that in question number 11, which that seemed difficult to most of our learners. There was question 14, uh, find the width of a rectangle given the perimeter. Question 19, reciprocal of mixed fractions. Those questions, again, proved difficult for our learners. There was question 21, percentages and its conversions. There was question 30, number of faces of a cube. Remember this closed cube and open cube. Most of our learners were not able to, to grasp the concept there. So in class seven, KEPSA exam, end of term two, the following were the most failed questions. There was question number four, divisibility test of number 11. 
my dear teachers, we are supposed to make sure that the learners are well equipped with this concept because it doesn't miss in most of the, if you look at most of the KCP papers and even the ones that we do, class seven and eight, divisibility test of number 11 is a common question. So it's an area we are supposed to dig in, we are supposed to dwell to make sure that the learners are supposed to be are, are well equipped. And especially where they are being asked, which is the smallest number that can be added to a certain or that can be deducted or reduced to make a certain figure divisible by 11. So we are supposed to revise these areas well. Question number four in class seven it was among the most failed questions in the CAPSA exam. <clears throat> In slide seven, there was also number eight, properties of angles. We are supposed to know that we have only two types of properties of angles. Those ones in, tri in a triangle and those ones in parallel lines. So this particular one was about properties of angles on parallel lines with a transversal. That's why we talk about alternate angles, corresponding angles, cointidial angles, and the others. There was question number 13. Surface area of, of cylindrical solids. Again, these are questions that we all know it rarely misses in any, any good paper. There are normally three of them, open cylindrical solid, there is closed solid, and there is an curved surface. So we are supposed to make sure that, that we cover that area well. There was question number 25 about money, specifically simple interest. In the CAPSA paper, it was among, again, the most failed question. Simple interest, and especially where time is given in months and uh, rate is given per annum. Most of the learners were not able to crack that one. There was question number 33, percentages increase and decrease. There is question number 49 in the 37 paper that was that tested solids uh, solids and nets of pyramids. So I'm not very sure whether we are supposed to be teaching pyramids in class seven, but the question come and we are supposed to make sure that our learners are aware. I will advise that solids and nets be taught in class seven, because most of the exam that we are doing, they are bringing pyramids as opposed to prisons. When you go to class eight, again, in the end of term two, KEPSA exam, the following were the most failed questions. According to us. So there was question number two, total value. I think what confused most of the learners is the, the word quotient. They, most of them didn't know that the word quotient actually meant division. There is question number 10, algebra, find the value of x. This is where you are given three fractions and you are supposed to get the LCM of the denominator and again multiply each fraction by the LCM. There was question number 17, commission with the word above. And again, here it's good to mention this question that comes with the word above. There are two of them. The one that asks you to get the total, total sale, the value of goods sold, and the other one, total earning. So we are supposed to make sure that our learners are well equipped with these two concepts because one of them, we are sure, must come in any of the KCP exams. Number two, uh, question. Volume of solids. Volume of solid, again, it was a question that was failed by majority of our learners in, in last term's end of CAPSA exam, end of term two CAPSA exam. Uh, we have number 20, ratio increase and decrease. Number 40, higher purchase, and especially why it is infused with the marked price, percentage marked price, where the question says the higher purchase was 10% more than the mark price. I think that one confused most of the learners. It's an area that we are supposed to revisit. Actually, teachers, these ones are feedback. These are areas that you are allowed to go back to class and reteach, if not revise. Good, now this, this is my favorite part. This is my favorite part, ways of improving mathematics performance. And I'm sure most of you are looking forward to this. Okay, after all that analysis, what do we do? What is the way forward? What are we supposed to do? What am I supposed to do as a teacher? So administer a diagnostic test with the aim of identifying the gaps. Anytime you are, are, are administering a test, 
Remember we said about evaluation. You are supposed to evaluate with an objective. Don't just pick a test anywhere. And remember the best test for the learners is the one the teacher has set or uh, the teacher has set himself or herself because it is objective. As you are giving the learners a test, what is this that you want to find out? What is this that you want to know? Remember, I call them gaps. You are supposed to give a very objective test so that it can help you plan for your next lesson. It can help you know which area you are going to emphasize more when you go back to class. So you are supposed to teach. Remember, the learners are learning. Then after that, you evaluate. How do you evaluate? By administering a diagnostic test with the aim of identifying the gaps. So you come, come up with, with your own test. Maybe it can be topical or the way you want it, depending on how far you are in your syllabus or depending on the learners. What is this thing that you want to discover? What do you want to know? After you get feedback, you are able to plan yourself better as the teacher. This one also happened to the, the, the teachers who are given new classes. You are told now you, you are not teaching these learners. It's a new year. You are going to teach this class. Before you start teaching those learners, it's always good to know where are they. Don't just enter class and you start giving them the new information. First of all, you need to administer a diagnosis, a diagnostic test. It is going to help you know where to start. It is going to help you rate your learners and know the method to use and even the rate or, or speed that you're going to take. Number two, you're supposed to analyze the results and keep a clear record of the questions failed by each learner and possible reason for getting them wrong. Meaning you are supposed to have clear record for each and every learner in your class and keep very clear and clean records for every learner, for every diagnostic test. So you are supposed to follow up with every learner. Not, don't just give an umbrella kind of feedback. You are supposed to give feedback specifically on each and every learner, on the areas they are wrong in. For example, if you do a test, do an exam, if a learner gets 60 out of 60%, uh, that learner has wrong, let's say 20 questions. You are supposed to ask the learner to write down possible reasons why they think they failed that question. Of course, you are going to read and see whether you can also add yours. That way you are able to help that learner to make sure next time the learner is not failing the same, same concept again. Number three, you are supposed to identify the topics of the most failed questions and highlight possible technicalities. See, a learner could be getting a question, say, on simple interest. Next time, the learner fails the same question. What are the issues in that simple interest? The learner fails the question when, when the rate is in percentage per annum, PA, and time per month. That's the that could be the technicality. So you identify the technicalities, come up with methods that are supposed to help that learner get it right. So you are supposed to discuss the most failed questions with the learners and let them tell their school the school of thought in each. So when a learner fails a question, don't be quick as a teacher to tell the learner the solution. Allow the learners to think. Allow the learners to discuss amongst themselves. Allow the learner, what do you think? How far did you go with this question? I'm also a classroom teacher and I go and ask my learners, why did you fail this question? It cannot be that you didn't, know the whole, you didn't know the whole of that question in its totality. There must be some areas that you know. Okay, show me what you know. Then from there, you are supposed to help. But allow the learners to tell you. Allow the learners to discuss between or amongst themselves. Allow the learners to work out the failed questions again after the discussion. After you had a discussion with the learner or the learners, allow them to do it again now as corrections. Let them write down an explanation after every question why they had failed the question. Not just doing corrections. Doing corrections will not help. Oh, you did a test, one to 10. You got seven, right, and wrong three. So you are supposed to 
do corrections, the ones you failed. Just writing them down will not help. Remember, questions are not repeated in exams. Concepts are repeated. So a learner might understand the question and fail to understand the concept. You have not helped that learner. So the learner is supposed to understand the concept, twist it a little bit, help the learner to think, but don't think for the learner. Provide the follow-up questions to help in reinforcement of the concept. Now, follow, we call them FQs, follow-up questions. If a learner failed a question on, let's say, nets, solid and net, after discussions, after doing that question again, now it's always good to provide follow-up questions. You, you can set or you can direct the learners to the books where they can get the questions. Let them do again, again, and again to a point that they have actually mastered that concept. Remember, I insist the learners are not supposed just to understand the question. They are supposed also to understand the concept for the sake of next time. So make use of the KCP papers, papers and other good uh, math revision question or past papers like KEPSA, which are KCP replica to help the learners. Follow-up questions are very, very important. Sometimes I, I, I laugh at, uh, at teachers who punish their learners who fail exams. See, the learner was supposed to get an 80%, but this time the learner has 60%. Then you as a teacher, you come with a pipe and you want to punish this child using corporal punishment. Remember teachers, nowadays we don't beat children. We stop that. Children belong to the government. So we stopped. So what you can do, and again, that beating, how will it help? What you can do as a punishment is, is if, a, if a learner failed five questions, so you can write down the topics from where those five questions came from, then tell the learner as a punishment, you are going to do 10 or five, depending on how many they are, for every topic that you failed as follow-up questions. So when the learner is doing a lot of questions, it's a punishment, yes, but at the end of the day, that learner is practicing. That learner is practicing a concept. So as a punishment, instead of beating the learner or beating that child, tell that child to do more of the same. If a child fails 10 questions, you can say, for every question you fail, go to that topic and do 10. You can see now 10 times 10, that's 100 questions and you reprimand, make sure that child has done all those questions. It is going to help in concept, uh, concept mastery. But when you beat, you're not helping. Now, there is exam formula that we are supposed to use. This is what we, so there's something called 3RUT, 3RUT. So anytime we do an exam, you are supposed to discuss exact problem with the learner. So the three R's are, the learner is supposed to read the questions critically as opposed to casually. Remember, most of the time our learners fail exam, not because they don't know, not because the concept was hard, but sometimes they, they didn't read well. They, didn't, they, they missed to see a certain word. They read casually as opposed to critically. So anytime you are also discussing the questions failed with the learner or with the learners, try to find out what could be the problem. Was it read? This learner did not read the question well. Remember, you are supposed to read for you to understand. There's no way you can understand before reading. And reading is done critically. How will you tell that a learner read the question? You look at the question paper. Did the learner underline the keywords? Did he or she circle the main words in a question? That's how you know a, a learner read the question well. But if a paper, the question paper, I don't know why we normally tell our learners not to write on the question paper. Let them make that question paper necessary dirty by underlining and circling the main words and the keywords. That way it will help them to read. Because sometimes they fail because they don't read the question. So out of the three R's we are talking about here, the first R is read the question critically as opposed to casually. 
So if there's a problem with reading, remember if there's a problem with reading, you can't go anywhere. So reading for comprehension, the learner is supposed to understand what he's reading. The other R out of the three R's is remember. Remember you have taught these people in class as a teacher. So the learner is supposed to remember what you taught them, what you said in class, what you told them to do. So it has to do with memory. So when you are discussing again the question with the learner, ask them, is it that you didn't read or you didn't remember? Then you hear them saying, teacher, I didn't read. Because probably these learners, they, may, they might fail the same question, but they didn't have the same problem. There's one learner who failed number four because of not reading the question. There's another one who failed the same number four just because he didn't remember something the teacher said. There's, a, there's another learner who failed just because he didn't review. Review means review the concept being tested in every question. You as a teacher, you are supposed to equip your learners with the concept in every subtopic and discuss the possible areas that can be tested. So when a learner is reading a question, already what is going through their mind is the possible ways how this question can be tested. So even when you come back now to give feedback, ask them, this question was asked like this, how else do you think this question can be tested? Revolving about the same, same question, the same, same topic, the same, same subtopic, the same concept. How else? There are possible ways you can do that with your learners. We have in class seven and eight, we have around 50 subtopics. Discuss every subtopic with the possible ways that can be tested in KCP. Also check how it has been tested before. Let the learners know this question can be tested like this. There are three boys who can sweep a room in five hours. How long will it take two boys or one boy to sweep the same room? That's just an example. That question can be like that. This, this can be, there can be an introduction of the word more. So you talk about it, you, you can write down how else do you think questions can be tested. You can check the questions, check in the KCP papers, check in CAPSA papers, check in the books, make sure, make sure they are well equipped with different ways a concept can be tested. That's what we call a review. So out of the three R's, we have read the question. So I hope your learners know how to read. If you have a problem with reading, talk to the teachers of English to help you do that. So remember, and the only way they are going to remember is because they have done it many times and they will remember. That's why sometimes even when you are teaching in class, we are supposed to deliver concept in a way they are going to remember. They can remember you saying something. They can even remember where you wrote it on the chalkboard or the whiteboard. They can remember that. They can remember someone who failed a question and what the teacher said. They can review different ways concept can be tested. So there are three R's, read the question, remember the question, review the question, uh, review the concept being tested. The other one is understand the question. I said, you'll find uh, several learners failing the same question. One failed because of not reading, one, one read but forgot something the teacher said or he read somewhere. There's another one who failed because he didn't review different ways this question can be tested. So could be the learner thought it is the same, same question, the same way like last, last exam. This time it is the same, but this tested differently. There's another one who read the question, but did not understand. So this is comprehension. So you are supposed to have these different categories of learners in your class. If you categorize them like that, you are able to meet their specific need and to help them next time perform better. But if you just give an umbrella feedback like that, it's not going to help. You'll be getting the same mean score every now and then. But if you are able to point to the real issues, to the individual learner, you are able to make them better. Remember, I said everything we do, it's because of the learner. The learner is the most critical worker. Then we have uh, the, the other one, the, we have a 
U, U is understand, then we have a T, think. So the learner is supposed to think. <laughs> I don't know how, how we are going to put this. We normally tell the learners, think, think. So how are we helping them to think? So you as a teacher, you are supposed to be a bit creative. Allow the learners to tell the learners to try and read the mind of the examiner. If you are the one who was testing this, if you ask your learners, if you are the examiner, what were the intention in this question? What are you supposed to say? So try to let them think by reading the mind of the examiner. The examiner's intention is this. If they're able to do that, they are able to understand the question, they're able to review, and they're able to, to do it well. So there are some people who are, who are raising their hands. Angelina, I don't know whether I'm, uh, I should allow them to ask question. Yeah, we, we have 25 more minutes. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think questioning moment should uh, start right away so that you can also have time to explain a few things here and there. Yeah. So members, I think we can start, those who have already put their hands up, that is yeah. Wilson. Maybe we can start with Will. Uh, Wilson has dropped his hand. Then we have Kenneth. Kenneth, maybe you have a question to our facilitator. Okay. I think uh, let us have Cindy Rose. Cindy Rose, unmute. Cindy Rose. I can see how many, I can see a few hands up. I don't know why they are not able to. Okay, ask the question. Okay. okay. Ask the question. <laughs> Raphael? <laughs> Mr. I think uh, we can use our chat. Yes, yes. Maybe they can write in the chat. Rather than unmuting everyone. I think, uh, yeah, let, let us have our chat. Uh, use our chat forum to answer questions because I've realized that uh, some of them are raising their hands. Maybe they are not ready. Uh, yeah. They're ready. I think uh, when you select someone, you can just, when you see a pop-up, the, the host will like to unmute you. You can unmute. Okay. Dixon Mutua. Have an, Dixon Mutua. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for this chance. I would like to be reminded about the KCP standardization formula. Okay, thank you. That's one. Um, the next one is Bonface Abuga. We want to take the question so that you can unmute. Yes, Bonface. Yes, which is the best way for teaching uh, algebra questions? Thank you. The question taken. Mr. Wander Wilson, please unmute. Okay. Let's move to. I'm there. I'm there, kindly. Okay. Mr. Wander. Okay. Thank you. Maybe my question. Just the facilitator to clarify on the formula that is the standardized formula and the details there. I'm seeing some excess there. I need some clarification. Okay, thank you, Dixon. No, thank you, Mr. Wander. Then Ken Murida, please unmute. 
כן? כן? אוקיי, okay. I think we can't get him. Let's move to David. Please unmute. And ask him. Yes. David, David, we, Raphael, have you had this question? No, no, no. Can you, David, look for a place with enough network, then you, we shall give you another chance. Let us go to Enos. Enos Namai, kindly ask your question. Hello. Hi. Yes. How can you help learners to review the concept being tested? Okay, very good. Uh, Sylvester Nyanga, kindly ask your question. Okay, thank you. My question is, there are some students who, don't, who are not willing to talk completely in class. How can you help them to, to be able to be interactive with the, the teacher and review the concept? Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you, Sylvester. Stephen? Uh, 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 thank you for the opportunity. In case if questions carry more marks, and if no, which question carry more marks? Questions yes? that are... Uh, you hear me? Yes, we have had this. Do you hear me? Yes, Stephen, we have heard you. Teacher mm. Raphael will assist us there. Thomas? Thomas? Hello? Yes, Thomas. Okay, let us go to Caspa. Okay. Caspa Makunja. Kindly ask your question. Kunja? Yes. From Young Muslim Academy, there is. Uh, my concern is uh, on tools of knowledge construction. How do we handle Microsoft Edge? Okay, I think this one is for IAN, Tools for Knowledge Construction. Thank you, Kasper. Then we go to Jose Akipto. Kindly unmute. Jose? Hello there. Uh, hello. Yes, we can hear you, Hosea. Okay, uh, as we know that you are approaching uh, KCP time, uh, I would like our facilitator to tell us only how best can we prepare these learners for, for the paper in carrying out their revisions. Okay, I think up to there, we can first answer those questions. Then we shall move on to the other, like uh, four hands also. If we have taken your question, kindly lower your hand so that we can have a, we can know how many people are still asking questions. Thank you very much. Raphael? Yes, Angeline? Yes, I think you have had some of the questions and also, Dean, you have had, uh, I think, two questions to, for your, for you. So welcome, Raphael. Thank you, Thank you um, I hope I'm loud and clear. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, teachers. I've had all your questions. 
and uh, I want to answer them in a, in a very brief way. The first question I had was about standardization. Uh, the formula for the, the formula that NEC uses for standardization is in KCP newsletter. If your school has a copy, you can always go there and see it. Nevertheless, I want to ask my fellow teachers, this animal called standardization, even though we are supposed to know there is something like that, I wish we can forget about it because it's not going to help us. It is not going to help us <laughs> right now. Forget about standardization. Tell your learners to get the maximum marks they can get. Tell them to get everything in any of the paper. If it's math, let them get 50 out of 50. Because if you start again tell, uh, telling them about this formula for standardization, again, they already have formula they are supposed to deal with in class. So again, if you start bringing this one in, it's going to complicate their, their life. So let them know there is something like that. But again, don't dwell on it so much. Otherwise, if you want to know for your own personal development as a teacher, the formula is there in the KCP newsletters, well explained. In case you don't understand, you can have a chat after this. I tell you how to go about it. For those who are interested, in, in case you want to standardize your marks, but I request you don't dwell on it so much, especially with the last. There's a school I went to visit and I found the teacher trying to discuss the standardization formula for almost two, two hours with the learners. Actually, teachers, that is a waste of time. Let us forget about it. Whatever happens in NEC, whatever they do, let them do. Because sometimes, there's a time I used to think so much about standardization and I've been let down. So from that time, I decided, ah, let NEC do their own thing and I will do my on this other side. We are supposed to help the learners get all the points correct. And there's a teacher who asked, how do you, how do you revise algebra question? Remember, this is mathematics. It's all about practice. Practice, practice makes perfect. You as a teacher, like I said, identify the specific areas where the learner has a gap. Remember, algebra has around six subtopics. There is simplification. There is inequalities. There is a formation of equations. There is find the value of y, find the value of the unknown. So which specific area are we talking about? So identify that as a teacher and do a lot of practice. That's it. Tomorrow said some. On yes, Rafael. Oh, there's somebody saying tomorrow's exam. <laughs> I don't know whether it's you. There's somebody who is who has unmuted. Oh, thank you. So identify the specific. Don't just say algebra in uh in general. In algebra, there is this and this and this and this. You'll find there is a child who doesn't have a problem with substitution. There's another one who doesn't have a problem with uh, finding the value of the unknown. Maybe the problem is in formation of equations. So dwell on that area as much as you can. Give enough practice. Enough practice will help the learner master the concept and build concept and build confidence. Uh, David, I didn't hear what you were saying. There's another one who asked about uh, how can you help the learner review the concept? Remember, my dear teachers, there's something called formative work and uh, summative work. Summative work is the exams that we do. The CAT, the evaluation, those are summative. Before summative, there was something called form uh, formative work. Formative work, that's, why, that's where you do all this work. You review, you train them to review the concept in every subtopic, meaning you must have spent a lot of time with this learner. Otherwise, if you didn't do that, in the summative, they are going to fail. Remember, summative is a reflection of what was hap happening in formative. In class seven and eight, though there is no, there is no CBC there, but formative is the, is the classwork, class discussions, um, homework that you give them. Group work, group discussion, those are, that's what we call formative. If it's done well, with your guidance as a teacher, the summer team, which is the exam, is going to flow. So you help them review in the formative. When you're in class with them, help them review each and every subtopic. 
you can write 10 different ways how algebra question, specifically finding the value of the unknown, how it can be tested. By so doing, you are building the confidence of that learner. And in the summative, they will surprise you how they can do it. Uh, this one, the, this, this one who talked about, there's a learner who can't talk. I want to advise, there's something called learning styles. I don't know that you heard of that. Remember, we have learners in class. These learners are not the same. One, they come from different bank backgrounds. They come from different, uh, di they have different personalities. So you, are, you as a teacher, you are supposed to equip yourself with what you call learning style. So identify the style that this learner uh, can get your, your concept from. Is it when you write it down? Is it when you use a friend to explain? Is it when you, when you say it in class? Is it when you show it? So try to understand the learning style of each and every learner in your class, including this one can't talk. If the learner cannot talk, there must be a way in which they get it. So I'll send you to learning styles try to get them, try to understand, and try to see how you can reach out to that learner. Remember, there are learners who don't ask questions. So you as a teacher, you're supposed to be very creative in trying to make that learner ask your question, or in trying to unravel or getting the gaps in that learner who cannot come out to talk. So learning style is key there. Uh, somebody asked, do KCP <laughs> questions carry the same mark? No, KCP don't carry the same, KCP questions don't carry the same marks. There's something you call snacks and charts. Snacks questions are simple structured questions that carry half a mark or, or, or one mark. There are some questions that are a bit heavy, like those questions of commission with the word above, higher purchase questions, those are sharks. Uh, construction questions, those are sharks and they carry a lot of marks as compared to the others. So in every paper, there are around 35 questions that can be done by any learner. There are around 15 questions that are, bit, that are a bit technical. We call them sharks and they carry a lot of marks. So uh, uh, unfortunately, these are the questions, the sharks. These are the ones our learners underline and they, they say, I'll do this one in the end. And they end up guessing when some time has run out. So encourage them that sharks questions carry a lot of marks. And in fact, they, they should even start with them. Uh, construction questions, please, again, I take you, I take this back to the teacher. Construction question, there is construction of circles, dropping perpendicular, construction of triangles. So you as a teacher, in the formative work when you're teaching them, you are supposed to prepare them on possible ways or possible questions that are tested in case. If you do that in class, in KCP, they will remember what you said. Remember in the three RUT, they are supposed to remember. So you are supposed to do a lot of work with your learners, take them through the questions that can be tested, use KCP questions and see how every question was tested, and use good books and good exams, and you'll be good to go. Thank you. Thank you. Raphael? For that, I think I can give a Beldin maybe a minute to give us a feedback on the question that was asked to her team. Beldin? Okay, thank you so much. So uh, probably uh, the question that was shared to my team are uh, some of the tools that we can use for knowledge construction. Remember, we were just mentioning a sample of the tools. We have several tools that exist in the digital space that you can use, but some of the examples that we mentioned are Microsoft Edge, which you can use as a search engine. Remember the same way you use Google to search for information, you can use Microsoft Edge. You can also use Google at the same time, Google Chrome to search for information. We have OneNote Plus Notebook. You can use that one also 
to get uh, to construct knowledge, collaborate with other students. Just like we mentioned at the beginning, the 21st century learning design is related right from the one that we started with yesterday, which is collaboration, knowledge construction, all are integrated in use of ICT for learning. We also have smart art graphics. You can be as creative as possible. It provides additional support for knowledge construction in the form of uh, graphics that helps learners to demonstrate uh, their understanding, interpretation, analysis, and evaluation of information. So stay tuned. We are still diving deeper and deeper into the 21st century learning design in some of the careers that we need to prepare our kids uh, for in the next future. Thank you so much. Back to you, Angeline. Wow, 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 Beldin. Thank you very much for that. I am feeling like I need to take a lady to ask a question before we close. That is Gladys. Can you Gladys ask the question? Gladys, unmute yourself. Okay, uh, on behalf of Gladys, I would, I would like to ask uh, how someone can help as uh, a student who, who, has, who has got a low capacity, a problem of capacity in mathematics. Sorry, we can't hear you. A problem in? In capacity, because, we, okay, we have learned that uh, the problem with the students in, uh, in, in, uh, in mathematics, one is uh, capacity and the other one, uh, the other one is, uh, is, uh, is attitude. Okay. So, as to, uh, a learner with the uh, low capacity in mathematics, how can that person be as assisted? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Then, uh, Cindy Rose, unmute, please. Cindy Rose. Yes, yeah. My question. Hello. Yes. I'm speaking. We have. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I'm asking, you have these students who know how to read very well, but understanding is a problem to them. How can we help them? Okay, that's nice. Raphael, I think you can assist us with those answers because of the interest of time. And then uh, we shall see the way forward after you have answered. Thank you. Welcome, Raphael. Thank you, Angelin. I've had questions. The first one is about the child who has an issue. So my advice would be, as a teacher, encourage. Encourage that learner. Because for sure, sometimes there is no much you can do if the problem is capacity. What you do, encourage, encourage. When that child does something good, however small it is, try to make it look like a big issue, let that child know he or she can still do it. Encourage, uh, affirm, recognize, and also pray for them. The other one is about the child who ca can read, but cannot understand. I, I don't know how those ones go together. If somebody can read, it means you... <laughs> You are supposed to read with comprehension. So if you are not understanding, it means you are not reading. Because reading is just not verbalizing words. You are supposed to read with comprehension. So how you can help that child is, uh, is try to give a test, diagnostic test, individual ones, just to test the step. Start with a, with a simple one. Find the value of this one. Start with a simple one. If that child gets encourage, high five, appreciate them with a sweet or something, incentives. Then after that, go to level two. Give them another one that's a bit difficult. Go to number three, a, a more difficult one, like that, like that, like that. As you try to build the confidence of that learner. But if you just come, come up with a hard one, first of all, you are going to kill the, uh, the, the morale. You are going to let that child know, I can't read. So try to, to, to come up with tests that have levels of difficulties and let that learner get it uh, slowly by slowly. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Raphael, for that. And we thank God for having you today. I know the questions are very many, but because of time, 
we may not be able to answer all the questions. So as KIPSA, we are going to look for some more time to have such a forum so that teachers can get engaged. We also want to know what we can do so that we can help our learners. Uh, those who are asking for the slides, kindly send your email address to 07, I hope people are writing, 0738, Two two seven five three three. Send your email to this number zero seven three eight two two seven five three three. Thank you very much for uh, having time for us and also for you wanting to know more about this subject mathematics. Tomorrow, we also welcome you. Encourage your colleagues to come for our social studies and CRE uh, analysis the way we have done as today so that we can have the best as teachers. On Thursday we have science and on Friday we have Kiswahili. So teachers let us encourage each other in our departments, let them participate. There is no learning that goes wasted. So at this small point I would like to end with a word of prayer from one of us, maybe Alice, Madam Alice, you can end with a word of prayer for us. Madam Alice. Okay, a volunteer to pray so that we can end this session. Thank you very much for having attended today's session. Let us meet in the next subsequent sessions for this week up to Friday. A volunteer to pray. Stephen Mutunga. Unmute yourself, Stephen. Okay. I think yes. I can end the, oh yeah. End with part of prayer. Yeah. Stephen? No. Okay. Alice? Okay, I think we can't get them. Let me just end with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father, this evening, we come before you. We thank you, Father, for the great session we have had. As teachers, we ask for forgiveness, O oh Lord. As we teach these children, O oh God, give us the patience that uh, we require so that we can be able to propel them to the next level, Lord. We thank you, God for the teachers who have been able to participate, for KIPSA, for IRON, for making sure that teachers continue getting the professional development uh, each and every time, oh Lord. We thank you, Father, for this evening. As we break for other sessions, oh Lord, we pray that, Father, you are going to be with us, you're going to guide us, you're going to protect us, and you're also going to give us the contentment in life that comes from above, oh Lord. We praise you, Father, and we glorify you. We pray this shortly, believing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes, we are done with our session. Let's meet tomorrow at 3 o'clock for Social Studies CRE. Thank you, members. We can now log out at our own time.